Well, hello, I'm Carrie Kirkham with the Molly Stones Wine and Spirits team. Thank you for joining us for this virtual Bravium wine tasting. We're going to be tasting along with winemaker Derek Rolfs. This is going to be a really exciting event for me because personally, I love Anderson Valley wines. Anderson Valley represents some of the best winemaking in California. If you think about Anderson Valley, not only do you have Bravium, you have Goldeneye, you have Rotorer Estate, Cake Bread, Hush, Navarro. This is a place of really great wine. And I'm really looking forward to uh, getting started with Derek and to you. Awesome. Thanks for the intro, Carrie, and stoked to be with you this evening. And all of you who have joined us, thank you for taking time out of your day. I mean, there's just a few things going on in the world, you know, these days. And uh, one of the things I love about wine is it brings us together and, it, you know, we're going to have an hour to talk about wine, talk a little bit about food, I think, right? And, uh, um, and wine and food pairing. And it's, uh, it's, it's just such a cool thing. I mean, it brings people together at, at the dinner table. It brings family and friends together. And uh, that's just one of the many things that, that drew me to a life of wine. So... With that, maybe, Carrie, should I talk about Bravium, maybe, how I got the project started, how long I've been making wine? Yeah, let's get the wine in our glass, and we'll start oh, yes. sniffing and talking. And Always then, a good idea. Yes, and then let's get to the story. Yeah, so please do, um, yeah, get some wine in your glass, and um, we will be talking about each of the three wines in detail and the vineyards and all that good stuff, but um, there's nothing wrong with... Uh, having a sip while I'm telling you my my origin story here so <laughs> I think Carrie's doing okay there you're good oh, you got the shirt man it is um the aroma is coming up from the glass I I can't wait all right please <laughs> okay awesome so uh so the Bravium was something I've been making wine for about 20 years and I started Bravium about seven years into my wine making um adventure and by then I had decided I wanted to focus on making Pinot Noir from coastal vineyards um, from central California all the way up to Mendocino. And the word Bravium, I, I settled on that as the name for the winery because it was a, it, I wanted something that reflected the gifts of nature. Um, and so I found this kind of obscure Latin um, word Bravium that um, kind of would allow me to, uh, to capture that. And, um, and I, I focused on making Pinot Noir from eventually 12 different vineyard sites from Santa Lucia Highlands all the way up to Anderson Valley. And I was having a great time making my wines and selling them all over California. And then in 2015, I had the opportunity to, uh, to start selling the wines outside California. And in the meantime, I had started making Chardonnay, a little bit of rosé that we sold at the tasting room in San Francisco. And then you fast forward to today and not to give away everything, but I'm making seven wines and I'm just getting ready to release a Blanc de Noir, a sparkling wine. So uh, the, the journey continues, the adventure continues, and I've never been you know, as excited about making wine as I am as I sit here before you today. And um, the hawk feather, the, the feather you see on the labels, that's a, a nod to my Cherokee ancestry and my Cherokee name, Winterhawk. And I do find hawk feathers throughout the, the vineyards that I farm now and uh, um, pick them up and put them on the side of the barn. And, and uh, it just seemed like an obvious, uh, you know, piece of art to grace the labels when we were redesigning the labels a few years back. That beg any questions for you, Carrie, or want to keep me, me to keep rolling here? Keep, keep rolling, but I want to talk about your stylistic uh, influence. This, this seems Burgundian in style, and, and if so, what region uh, were you most inspired by, if at all, by Burgundy? See, we're, we're five minutes into this, and you've already invoked the B word, Carrie. So, I'm sorry, I knew. No, it's great. I, I'm <laughs> glad you did. I, I usually play a game with myself. How, how long does it take for me to say Old World or Burgundy or, or Burgundian? But, uh, sorry. <laughs> Totally. So, um, yeah, I think, um, you know, obviously I'm making wines in California and I'm making, you know, the wines we're drinking today, this evening are, are the wines that I produced from Anderson Valley. But there is, um, a, you know, a connection there. I mean, as you see on this winemaking philosophy slide, you know, these are old world traditional practices. I try to be a minimalist. 
I try to, um, you know, not use equipment, not use technology to try to fix every problem. I met um, Jeff Patterson, um, Patterson from Mount Eden early on in my winemaking. And I said, what advice would you give to an, an upstart like me? And he said, don't mind by the numbers. And while I did take winemaking 101 and a bunch of other classes at Davis and learn how to make wine, you know, the, the right way, the scientific way, um, I do subscribe more to a philosophy of, you know, that old saw wine is made in the vineyard and get it right in the vineyard, you know, prune properly, dry farm the property if you can, do these things that are going to allow the fruit to ripen it at low bricks, which equals low sugar, which equals low, relatively low alcohol. And a lot of that's driven by the sites that I'm working in as well. But, you know, what does that give you? If you, if you, if you get it right in the vineyard and you take that, that light-handed approach in the winery, that, that, that traditional, you know, Burgundian approach, um, you know, with native yeast doing the, playing their part, um, French oak barrels, some Hungarian oak we're going to talk a bit about when it comes to the Chardonnay. They, you know, you do get, at least I'll say, uh, you know, we don't have to call it old world, new world style, but we can call it like a, a terroir driven style, you know, wines of sight and place and time. That's really what I'm, I'm interested in doing. And uh, if it's a hot year, I want you to taste that it's a warm year and the alcohol is going to be a little higher. If it's a cool year, I want you, I want that to be reflected in the wines and captured in the wines as well, Carrie. Hey, Derek, it's, K, it's KP here. We have a quick question. Considering your nod to old world winemaking, James Rambeau wants to know, have you considered trying to make wine with Oregon fruit? Wow. Um, you know, it's, I have had one com crazy conversation about that before. So the answer is a, a real small yeah. Like I, I, I'm really interested in Oregon and learning more about Oregon. I have some friends um, up there that, that make some amazing wines. Um, any of you have heard of Lingua Franca? Um, the, some of the winemakers up there, I, I, last time I went to Hungary to pick out my, my oak, we all went as a group and uh, had a great old, great old time. So I'm big fans of what they're doing up there. And uh, yeah, I mean, who knows? I, I thought, it would, I, I thought it would, I'd be 80 years old before I got to make a sparkling wine. And, uh, and I've checked that off my list already. So maybe there are some Oregon adventures in, in, the, in the future. Wow, very cool. So um, I've told you like, you know, my philosophy. Now I'm just gonna show you a couple of pictures of the winemaker's studio. This is a facility that uh, really is, an, is a state of the art facility that we built in 2017 in St. Helena. I've told you I'm kind of a trad traditionalist minimalist. One of the things we're looking at here right in the middle is an optical sorter that I, I bypass um, when I'm running my lots, but I do share the space with my friends from Ziada and Mason Cellars, and they make a lot of Cabernet and, and varieties where you do really, uh, you know, using an optical sorter can in, in, in increase your quality. The other reason I don't use the optical sorter is when it comes to my, my the Pinot Noir I pick for my Rosé or my, or my Blanc de Noir or the Chardonnay grapes that I pick, and even some of the, the Pinot Noir, we're, we're using whole clusters. So we're using not just the grapes where we destem the fruit and could run it through a sorter. We're, we're just by hand sorting the fruit in the vineyard and in the winery. And then we're, um, we're putting those whole clusters in the case of the, the Chardonnay directly into, into the press or, the, or the, the Pinot Noir for Rosé or Blanc de Noir. So we want, that, um, we want to press that, that, that juice off from the whole clusters. And in the case of the Pinot Noir, some of those clusters between 10 and 50% are going into the fermenters where, where those stems and, and are gonna be in contact with the fermenting uh, juice and eventually wine for uh, sometimes two or three or four weeks. So, uh, so you know, that's another traditional Burgundian approach. And uh, the other things you're seeing in this, these pictures here are some large format oak fermenters. And these are, th those ones with the Ks on them, those are 15 hectoliter Hungarian oak fermenters, about 400 gal gallons, just to, just to tra transmit it um, from metric into the English system. And, um, and I ferment and age the Chardonnay in those oak fermenters that I designed the last time I was in Hungary. And that's something I'm trying to do more and more of is get more juice and wine in contact with less oak. And I'm doing that in, by use of these fermenters, which are, which are awesome. And I really love the last two, three years we've been using them, the results we've gotten. And also I'm using larger format, what we call punchins, 500 liter, about a little over twice the size of a normal oak barrel um, to again, get that, 
that slow oxidative effect of oak barrel fermenting and aging, but, um, but less of the overt oak. I want you to smell a bit of oak spice and maybe get, pick up on a little bit of vanilla. Um, but I, I don't want the oak to be the first thing you get. I want the oak to provide the structure and lift the fruit and provide aromatic complexity. So uh, that's something, you know, I, I told you I've been making wine for a lot of years now, but I'm still, every year we're experimenting with new vessels, new ways of fermenting. I built a cold room at the winery to ferment very cool and, and slow. So everything we do is, is, is still evolving, you know, even though I think we've got it about 90% figured out that last 10% is going to take me the rest of my life. So that is amazing. The cold room, and that's a nice way to maintain a low, slow, and cool primary fermentation, which ensures all those phenolics will develop just beautifully. All of the delicate flavors and the delicate aromas are preserved during that cool, slow fermentation. That's exactly just right. fantastic. That's really a focus on craft, and it's coming across in the wine. Um, some California Chardonnays to me are wines that have a lot of makeup, makeup and plastic surgery, so to speak. <laughs> this is a natural beauty, an absolute natural beauty. It is phenomenal. Anyway, I'm sorry, continue. <laughs> no, that, I, I love your thought and I totally agree, especially when it comes to Pinot Noir or Rosé, you can, you can really see when a wine has been overhandled, over manipulated, it's really obvious, you know, and uh, Chardonnay, maybe not so much Chardonnay. They call it a winemaker's grape. You know, you can do a lot of things to Chardonnay because it's so semi-neutral. It's not super aromatic. But what I'm going for with all my wines is some balancing acidity. And if there's a continuum of style, you know, I'd like to be somewhere in the middle. You know, I don't want to be too high alcohol. I don't want to be too extracted, too much use of new oak. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be, you know, I've taught myself I don't really love the the stainless steel reductive, you know, lean, mean kind of side of things either. I, I, I love to drink some of those wines occasionally and I, I find it fascinating. But for me, the two match achieve, you know, you have acidity meeting up with mouthfeel and texture and you have fruit joining savory notes. And it's that interplay between somewhat opposite or, or disparate things. That's when you put those things together, mm -hmm. You know, all of a sudden, two plus two doesn't equal four; it equals you know ten. And it's like that's the magic of of wine is, and the only way you can do that, I found for me. And you know, you ask, you know, a bunch of other winemakers the same question, you'll get a bunch of other answers. But for me, it's it, it's by working in that in that middle of, of the stylistic range of these varieties and picking the right sites and growing the grapes, as we see in this map here. You know, in these cool co coastal sites about nine ten miles from the Pacific Ocean. You know what? Do we have any other really questions? I thought I saw a chat question pop up before yes. we roll into Anderson and in the Rosé. Thanks, Derek. Um, we have another question about if you've used concrete eggs or have you ever experimented with them or are you interested in using them? So the answer to all three of those questions is yes. <laughs> I know that seems like it couldn't be, could it? But um, yes, I, I have used them. I have experimented with them. Um, and I haven't made it an ongoing part of my winemaking so far. It's been an experimental part that hasn't quite, you know, joined the fray like, like those, those large form, format oak fermenters have. Um, but I continue to experiment. We have two of them in the winery right now that we are experimenting with. And, uh, and that's another way of kind of, you know, it's not exactly the, the, the um, missing link between stainless, you know, fermenting in a stainless steel tank and aging in a stainless steel tank and fermenting and aging in an oak, for, oak fermenter or oak barrels, but it, you do have some of the benefits and reduced cons of both of those. You have, you know, some, some um, uh, you have more evolution of the wine than you would in a stainless steel tank. Um, and, and you have some interesting fermentation kinetics because of the shapes of some of the concrete eggs. Um, but, uh, but you don't get as much oc oxidation or that oxidative effect as you get through the staves of the oak. Have you noticed how uh, wines that are done in concrete, it lends a certain minerality to it? Yeah, Have absolutely. You I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's literally pulling that out of the concrete. Yeah, I mean, that's, and, and I think it's just a function of that, again, the fermentation kinetics and, and uh, the effect on the acidity. 
And by reductive, um, you, you mean the reductive nature. Some of our um, viewers might not know the organoleptic impact of a reductive wine, you know, wine that it doesn't see much oxygen. Can you explain reductive just a little bit for us? Yeah, so basically there's two sides of this equation. There's the, you have, on one side you have oxidation and we all know what that means. You know, if you open up a bottle of wine like we all are tonight and you leave it on your counter long enough, the oxygen is going to get to work with the alcohol. It's going to turn into acetaldehyde. It's eventually going to turn into acetic acid. You're going to have vinegar, right? But along the way, you're going to get these interesting aromas of like, you know, bruised apple or, or a nuttiness will, will kind of come into play, right? So it, so it has a, to your point of organoleptic and sensory notes, it starts to take on this, you know, sherried like character um, versus the reduction is kind of the opposite of that. It's, it's, it's making the wine, it's working with the grapes, it's working with the wines in a in an, in an uh, anaerobic or non-oxidative environment. And so you get less of that natural development and you sometimes get um, this kind of like, what would be the thing, flint kind of character, you know, matchstick, this kind of like, um, sometimes it even evolves or devolves depending on your point of, point of reference to like a, a, a canned uh, vegetable <laughs> character. Yeah. You know, it can take on these really um, interesting things where you're like, am I smelling green beans or asparagus or some of these other, the other kind of notes? And so, um, again, for me, I'm, I'm, I want to be somewhere in the middle, right? I don't, I don't want the wine to taste kind of tired and bruised, but I also, you know, too much reduction can be a challenging thing. And I, I could riff on this for a while and as it specifically relates to, relates to Chardonnay. But one of the things I do is I do a hyper oxidative um, treatment right up front where, where we give the wine a ton of oxygen, don't put any sulfites in the wine. The wine turns black almost. It, it, it's crazy what happens. But, um, and, and what that does though, is it, it, you, you, you drop out some of the phenolics of the wine and you, you kind of um, immunize the wine against further oxidation and aging. So we give it a ton of oxygen. So it's immune to oxidation, which is another <laughs> counterintuitive thing. But uh, um, that's one of the, th the reasons that I think my Chardonnay tends to stay fresh. And one of the th reasons I think it'll, it'll be good, you know, five years, from now, 10 years, from now, 20 years from now. So it has ageability. This bottle has an aging potential. Nice. I think so. I, I recently had my first Chardonnay I ever made. Well, for Bravium in 2009, I made Chardonnay before, but um, for Bravium and, uh, and it still has a ton of fruit and it's got another five, 10 years easy. So my friend, John Gilman, who's very kind to review my wines and, I think one of his reviews might be in here later. He, uh, he always puts these crazy reviews in my wines where they're always like 2030 to 2055. And I tell him he's a little nuts. But, um, and I hope I'm around to, to taste these wines in 2055. But, uh, you know, I think the, the way we make the wines and also the acidity that we get, the natural acidity we get out of these wines, growing them you know, near the coast like we do. Um, acidity is what helps you age wines, especially Pinot Noir and Chardonnay we're talking about here because we don't have the tannins that you have in a Cabernet. You know? Before we get to the rosé, I want to talk about what people are tasting and smelling in their glass in the Chardonnay, because um, it really is something. I do, I do have, does anybody have a glass with them? That is just beautiful. Yeah. Tell us on the chat. I, can, I can't see all the chat, but uh, KP's, KP will jump in, I know. Yeah. yeah can Go back one to the to the Chardonnay slide, please. I just want to focus on what this the the aromas and and what's going on. Do you want to KP? Do you want to just bounce to the Chardonnay slides and we'll come back to the rosé? Is that okay? Yeah, I, I'm getting, so much. I'm getting like a tropical fruit and dried uh, summertime like hay mm -hmm. and uh, little white blossoms like maybe jasmine. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it's so fresh in the nose. It is a fresh, alluring nose. And personally, Carrie, I love the acidity of this wine as well when you taste it. And that's from, pick, that's from picking at proper bricks. That's from having a really good acidity and good uh, balance between acid and, and, and bricks. And I love the low alcohol content. That's 13.4% alcohol, which makes it a great dinner wine. Um, you can share this bottle with a friend and not have to worry about it knocking your block off. It, it, it is it is very uh, reserved. Uh, it's like a European alcohol level. I love this. 
it's you can have more than more sense. than one sip, more than one glass. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about too. yeah Anderson Valley and and just continue on the Chardonnay here? Um, I know, and I know some of you, John. I just saw his chat thing. I think some of you I heard earlier today. Some of you might be drinking the 2018, and some of you maybe the 2019. Is that true? Maybe this is the 19 that I have. I have right. the 19, but uh, for yeah. a flavor standpoint, I'm getting this uh, lemon pie quality, uh, blossoms, wonderful minerality, and a touch of, of warm baking spice, just a hint. And it's in the finish, and it has such a nice lingering finish and a balanced acidity that makes this beautiful to pair. Uh, with food. Uh, Derek, really yeah, so I know John, go ahead, Catherine. Derek, do you mind talking a bit about where this fruit is sourced for the Chardonnay, please? Yeah, of course. So um, so I started making the Anderson Valley Chardonnay. It, it entered my, my lineup in 2018. And uh, um, I've been working with Valley Foothills Vineyard for the last 10 years, but mostly for Pinot Noir, for my Anderson Valley Pinot and my Anderson Valley Rosé I was producing. And when... Uh, you know, Anderson Valley, just to talk about Anderson Valley for a, a moment, um, I'm, I'm guessing many of you have been up there to Boonville, Philo, Navarro on your way to Mendocino. Um, it's 100 miles north of San Francisco, give or take, depending on what part of the valley you're trying to get to. And grapes have been grown in Anderson Valley since the 1800s. But it became an AVA in 1983. The year before that, um, Rotor came along and set up shop and, uh, and, and their, their domestic uh, sparkling house. And back in 83, when it became an AVA, um, it was dominated by Chardonnay, Gewürztraminer, and Riesling. And Pinot Noir was an was a afterthought, barely getting started up there. And you fast forward to today, and there are 2,500 2, acres planted. And I think about, uh, goodness, I think about 1,700 acres is Pinot Noir. So Anderson Valley is really, you know, just in the past, you know, less than 40 years has become you know, one of the most, um, you know, single variety dominated um, uh, appellations in California. And you might say, well, why are you talking about that, Derek? You're supposed to be talking about the Chardonnay. That's, that, that's meant to, to tell you the story that there are all, most of the Chardonnay that's planted in Anderson Valley, which I think is just, you know, 500, 600 acres, goes into the sparkling wines. It's, it's farmed by Rotor and it's farmed by Scharfenberger and some of these other folks that are doing sparkling wines out of Anderson Valley. So there are very few Chardonnay vineyards that were planted, you know, with the right material in the right sites, farmed the right way, pruned the right way to make still wines. And so when, when Casey, the, the, the vineyard manager at Valley Foothills said, Hey, Derek, I've got a couple blocks here that are opening up. Do you want to, you want to take some Chardonnay? I jumped at the chance because I've been thinking about it for seven, eight years. And so um, I'm working with two blocks in Valley Foothills, which is in the, the heart of Anderson Valley, right um, near Navarro, for those of you who have, have made the, the trek up there. So the sweet spot of the valley. And uh, you get what you get in that, that part of the valley is you, you get a little bit of fog and a little bit of that coastal influence, but you also get some really sunny, warm days. And so it's a great place to, uh, to ripen, ripen grapes. And Chard the Chardonnay is really um, it's been a, it's been an adventure for me. You know, some of you heard drinking the 2018, it was a little higher in alcohol. Um, I probably, you know, looking back, um, I'll be totally honest and transparent with you. I probably wish I picked those grapes about five or seven days earlier. That's the one thing as a winemaker that I really, you know, have a big influence over, but it was a learning experience because, you know, it is a little warmer there than Wiley, the, 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 the piece that I farm, you know, five miles to the Northwest of Valley Foothills. So I learned that lesson and I think carry that freshness that you're talking about when you taste the 2019, that's something that I was very intentionally trying to make sure I captured. And, uh, and I, you know, I captured it again in 2020 and um, hopefully I keep capturing that going forward. I like the 2018 wine. I think the thing it has that I really love is, 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 is really, um, a great texture and mouthfeel, you know, almost a, a mouth coating, you know, oiliness. Um, it's really kind of fascinating. Um, but uh, but the, the two wines have similar aroma, you know, uh, similar aromas and flavors, and you can definitely tell they're from the same vineyard. Terry, is there anything else you want to mention about Chardonnay before we move to rosé? I, I am ready for rosé. I have my <laughs> bottle right here, and I want to point out that I have my 
taste of Mendocino glass right here to taste it out of. How about that? Nice. Classic. I love Mendocino. Gosh. Yeah, John, just to answer your question on the Chardonnay, I see John's questions here, they're popping up. Yeah, they're, they're 18 and 19 from the from the same vineyards. Um, I'm working with the same Valley Foothills fruit, same blocks. And that's really something that's important because I always tell the crew in the winery, you know, it takes us about three to five years to really figure out a vineyard um, when we start working with it for the first time. So, um, and it is located in Anderson Valley, yeah. Um, so. You know what's uh, amazing? I'm I'm smelling, I'm nosing the rosé and my first thought is I can't afford this. Huh. It's too amazing, but it is an affordable wine. I've, it is stunning. The nose on this, yeah. Derek. Huh. Wow. Okay. Sorry. No, that's the rose keep keep going. <laughs> I'm going to hire you to write all my tasting notes. No, that's my first, my first thought. I can't afford this. Oh my God. Okay. So please, please tell us the story of this alluring rosé. Sure. So to tell the story of this rosé, I need to tell the story of Wiley Vineyard. And I've talked a little bit about Anderson Valley. You know, in the 60s, 70s, um, these uh, trailblazers, pioneers were going up to Anderson Valley and figuring out, you know, what they should plant in this modern era of Anderson Valley. And uh, one of those trailblazers, you know, crazy people, was this gentleman by the name of Brad Wiley. And he came out to California from New York in a Volkswagen um, a bus and um, decided that he was gonna buy 250 acres in the Northwest corner of Anderson Valley and grow grapes. And when I asked Brad, you know, when I first met him like 10 years ago, I said, why did you buy this particular piece of land? He said, Derek, it's all I could afford. And um, the reason it was all he could afford is, you know, and it, it was something he could afford was that it's uh, nobody thought you could ripen grapes because it was so close to the ocean, nine miles from the ocean. So um, he was, uh, he turned out to be, you know, smart, uh, prescient, lucky, but um, because anyone in the Valley with 250 acres would trade him um, right now, because it turns out that this Northwest, what we call the deep end of the Valley is just the perfect place to grow um, uh, Pinot Noir, especially, and also Chardonnay and Riesling and Pinot Gris, that, which we also grow in the vineyard. Um, so I came along in, in 2010, started working with the, the Wiley Fruit. You know, by 2015, 2016, 2017, I was doing some farming work there, grafting over some of the blocks to some better performing material. And Brad and I had a meeting after the 2017 harvest, where, and he offered me the opportunity of a lifetime, which was to jump in and take over and, and start farming the property. And so I did that. And uh, so this I actually, you know, now I've, be, I've become the farmer that I always wanted to be and, and grew the grapes that go into this, this Wiley Vineyard, 100% single vineyard um, Rosé of Pinot Noir that we're, that we're uh, tasting here tonight. And it's a, it's a blend of different clonal material, as you see here on the slide. It goes into used French and Hungarian oak barrels. I'll talk about Hungarian oak here in a, in a moment. And I make a whopping uh, thousand six packs of this wine. And as if fate would have it, I woke up early this morning and, and went into the winery and we bottled up the 2020 um, Wiley Vineyard Rosé of Pinot Noir. And I, I grabbed a bottle off the line and there it is. Um, Ooh. And, uh, yeah. So, um, so we're uh, going to, we bottled it up today and we'll release this wine on Valentine's Day, as I always do in homage to my wife, because it's her favorite wine. And uh Speaking of my wife, I think one of my wife's friends, Nina, is on tonight's call. And uh, Ginger says, hi, Nina. I had to get that in. A little shout out for Nina. Hey, Karen, we have a, we have a couple guests that have their hand raised. Uh, I'm going to ask if it's uh, all right. Marianne Amaya, do you want to ask your question? Marianne, are you there? She need to come off mute, maybe? Yep. Uh, no, no, I did that by mistake. Go on. Okay. okay, David, do you have a question? David Garces? Okay, go ahead, guys. Sorry about that. Okay, no problem. And keep the questions coming via chat, too, if you'd like, everyone. We'd, um, uh, one thing I want to point are... out is, the, and again, low alcohol, 12.5% alcohol. So, again, yeah, you know, this is probably from picking. 
when you see 12.5 on a label, especially from, from Europe or the old world, right? Um, it's usually a placeholder value. Um, but in the case of all my wines, I actually do put the, to the decimal point, actual alcohols on the bottles, even though we're legally given a little wiggle room on that, Carrie. Okay, nice. It's very important. And I, I you know, that's a function of, of the site, like Wiley, like we're seeing on the map here. You know, it's one of the last vineyards um, that you'll hit in the valley before it, the road gets narrow on the way out to the coast. And, and uh, we did the great producers out of Anderson Valley earlier, Carrie, at the beginning, and I'm glad you did. But one other producer I want to mention is uh, Reese Vineyards, which uh, they farm Bearwalla Vineyard right across the street from Wiley. And they did a, a climate study recently, my friend Jeff Brinkman, the winemaker, and they, they showed that um, the, the temperatures are relatively cooler in the deep end of Anderson Valley than anywhere in the Cote d'Or or Burgundy. So we see we're invoking the B word a second time oh, on this call. But, uh, I love it. Um, but that's just, you know, that's not the only factor, but it, it is, you know, we get these cool nights and we get, we get these sunny days, but, but the temperatures are low. So we get that slow ripening and we get, you know, shallow, well-drained soils. And what that gives you is that ripeness at low bricks. And that's something for me, for the style of Pinot Noir I want to make and the style of Rosé and Bloc de Noir that I want to make. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for low sugars, high, you know, relatively high acidity. And, uh, you know, and then we can put the Rosé through a partial malolactic conversion like I do. And you, you get a little creaminess in, in the mid palate. But you saw that spine of acidity. I always think in visual terms, you know, that acidity cuts across your palate um, like a knife, but you get, it broadens in the mid palate just a bit, just a touch. Yeah, a lot of times rosés are very um, much like north, south, east, west. They're points you can easily pick out. This is something where it's so complex. I'm like, where is it going? Because it does have that nice mouthfeel, but it also has the acidity. So it evolves on the palate nicely, like, like a circle. Um, yeah. What was your influence? It's a line and a circle. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. And, and what so what, what was your European wise, as, as far as region, what would you compare this to? Oh, I don't even know. I mean, I mean, there's, you know, most of the European rosés I drink are out of Provence or Tavel or someplace like that. And they're, they're working with completely yeah. different varieties. Right. So and I'd have a hard time comparing it to Europe, probably the rosé. Um, but uh, but I, I I love making it, you know. And um, and I, I I really again it's a it's a it's an effort to achieve balance or some some middle of the road approach, you know. So um, this is your your wife's favorite wine. It what is. What is her pairing with this wine? I'm sure she has a pairing preference to this. Uh, a glass. <laughs> 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 and, a, and, a, and, a, and a corkscrew, yeah. a corkscrew and a glass. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is perfect, actually. Yeah. Or your um, favorite pairing, your favorite food pairing. We, we, um, we have a, so I'm, the, I'm the, the grill guy, the smoker guy in the house. And uh, we drink a lot of rosé with the, with the stuff I'm pulling off the grill. Um, okay. So I usually, uh, yeah, out of the bottle. I like that, John. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, out of the bottle. Totally. Just a that, that is really all you need. This is so beautiful. So beautiful. It's approachable and it's affordable. And one other it's thing we had this with recently, Carrie, we had, uh, we did um, turkey burgers on the grill mm. and, uh, and, and with, with the, the rosé. And I thought that was, that was really nice, you know, so. Derek, we, we have some questions. Adoringly, people are calling you a mad scientist uh, in the- in Oh, the, uh, I've been promoted. I love that. Can I put that on my business card? Or my e-signature? Would you say that your choice of Hungarian oak makes you a little mad or crazy? Can you talk a little bit about how you decided to, to focus in on Hungary? Yeah, totally. Um, so, and, and this applies to all the wines. Every wine that we're drinking tonight aged in a certain amount of Hungarian oak, but especially the Chardonnay. Um, about 80% of my Chardonnay is, is fermented and aged in Hungarian oak. And Hungarian oak is this fascinating thing. You know, if you it's just like wine. It's, it's history, it's geology, it's geography, it's politics, it's, um, it's chemistry. Um, it's, it's, it's everything all rolled up in one. And, and so to tell you the, the, you know, the cliff notes version of about Hungarian oak, um, there's this amazing forest in the Tokai region of, of Hungary called the Zomplin. And it has a higher percentage of Petraea, Quercus Petraea, which means oak of the rocks. Um, that's Latin. Um, 
it uh, uh, than anywhere in like, you know, the, the renowned forests of France, like Troncé or, or some of these ones that have super renown and the barrels from there are the most expensive barrels in the world. Well, well, the, the type of oak that you find in those, in those um, uh, famous forests might be 70, 80% Petrea. And in Zomplin, it's almost 100%. And, and so you have the right material, the right genetic material. And then you have these, these shallow, devigorating soils, snow all winter long, um, very dry summers. And so what you get is a you know, very um, uh, tight grain, you know, because it, it, it's hard to grow the oak there. And so that, that picture you see of my friend Andres Scalati, the, the, the head of Kadar Hungary, He's standing next to a hundred plus year old tree and it's only like, you know, 12 to 18 inches in diameter. And so it takes a lot of years for these, for these trees to grow and you get this tight grain. And what does that mean in the wine? Well, that means that that, that wine that's in contact with it isn't going to get a lot of that really overt oaky character. It's going to get um, more of the uh, eugenol, you know, um, the, the spice notes. It's going to pick up, it's going to pick up a bit of tannin, you know, that, that provides structure for the wine, but it's not going to overwhelm the overwhelm the wine like you know other species or other oak that's grown in other parts of the world like America um, might. So um, you get this you get this uh, you get this great aromatic complexity, and you get this structure, and and I would argue that this Kadar Hungary is one of the you know the 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 best. Um, cooperages in the world, and 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 you know the, the oak they're working with in the Zomplin Forest is some of the best wood in the world. Um, but like I mentioned, politics, you know, it was behind behind the Iron Curtain for a lot of years, and people just it was lost to history for you know fifty odd years, and we've rediscovered it now, and um, um, it's I I couldn't imagine making my Chardonnay without it. I was really excited to see that you're using Tamilari Kadar. I know the Molnars very well, and they're, they also produce wine. But in particular, their yeah. stave yard where they age the staves is of particular note. And, I, and to see it in your the notes, right corner there, yeah. the stave seasoning is incredibly important. And that's what sets apart Tamilari Kadar and Hungarian oak in general from the others. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, well, that that picture of that that oak tree and then the stave yard, it's in the same forest. They, they they sited their stave yard in the forest. And if you go to Burgundy to some of the, you know, the best um, cooperages in 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 France, um, they're the staves are aging on asphalt or blacktop. You know, I mean, they're they're near the city center. You know, it's not in a forest, so it's naturally beautiful. But it also provides more of the 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 um, you know the fungi and bacteria that 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 break down the wood. And, and, um, and, you know, there's a river that runs right next to it. And, and that has an impact on, on again, that the, the breaking down of that wood and the, and, and the compounds, the chemical compounds that are then eventually released into the wine. So it's, uh, yeah, they're, they're doing it better than anyone I know. And uh, I'm happy to support them and I'm happy to, uh, you know, um, collaborate with them because, you know, we're doing these larger format vessels now and that's been a fascinating thing to do with them. And um, Quercus Petraea in particular, is, it, it's just, it has its own unique attributes versus like Quercus Alba, which would be an American oak. That's right. Um, and so, Quercus Rover and yeah, the other, Rover. all the other kinds. Yep. Right. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. Very, um, we can, we can get geeky and nerdy for just a little sorry. while, right? <laughs> sorry. Yeah. No need to apologize. I love to geek out on Quercus Petraea. <laughs> um, is it all right if we move on to the Wiley Vineyard Pinot Noir carries or anything else you want to add? No, it is a beautiful balanced uh, rosé. Um, you can have it with food or not. And I really do think a glass is the best pairing. You just need to get <laughs> it out. Of the yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, rosé goes with, rosé is great. I mean, Pinot Noir as well, right? It goes with so many different foods. Um, and I want to point out, it's not, it's not a porch pounder. It is not a porch yeah. pounder rosé. This is a rosé to seriously sit, consider, enjoy, appreciate, allow it to evolve and take it all in. Beautiful rosé. Yeah, thanks. And, and as with all the wines, I mean, I've kind of skipped over some of the winemaking pieces here, but I've mentioned some of them, you know, um, wild yeast, you know, makes a difference in, in I think how these wines come out. Um, I think the fact that we're handpicking these grapes at night 
all of the all of the grapes we we grow um we pick them all at night and uh bring them into the winery when they're cool keep keep the fruit pristine and, and cool um i think the uh you know aging the wine fermenting and aging in the cold rooms at the winery is really important as we've talked about and uh rolling right into the pinot noir here you know especially when you're working with with this uh this fruit out of wiley because wiley you, you know we were talking before carrie about about wines being transparent you know um and in the case of wiley we're talking about fruit that is uh some of the vines are are you know upwards of 40 years old now they're in the prime of their life and uh and the grapes, you know, we typically tip, pick them around 22, 23 bricks and, and bring that fruit in. And so it's not, this isn't a blockbuster, super powerful, you know, style of Pinot Noir. It's a, uh, this is a wine of elegance and, and um, you know, delicacy. And, and I think, you know, that's the only way you get that really um, perfumed, you know, nose is by, you know, taking that light handed approach and not throwing too much oak at it. In the case of this wine, it's fermented 30% whole cluster. And uh, um, and it sees about, you know, uh, shoot, it sees about, yeah, 25% in the typical year, 20 to 30% somewhere new oak. More French oak in this one than the Chardonnay. I really love, you know, some of the French cooperages for the Pinot, um, but it does see a little bit of Kadar. We're a whopping 449 six packs of this wine. So this is basically my favorite 12 barrels, um, you know, that I produce out of Wiley every year. I take all the Pinot Noir from Wiley for myself. I sell um, one block to Schramsberg. Um, many of you might've heard of them, very renowned sparkling wine producer. And they've been taking that block um, for the past 30 years. So when I took over, I- uh, A viewer? I kept selling to them. No, no, you first, sorry. When you took uh, over what? I'm, I'm all done, go ahead. Oh, sorry, uh, a viewer, John Gantist, uh, pointed out the color. And he said, John, thank you for pointing that out. Amazing color. I have a little tissue to, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm sorry, but I got excited. Uh, that color is beautiful. When I see this color in Pinot, uh, I get very excited because it is just perfect. It is a luminous gar garnet color. Um, absolutely gorgeous. And, and great clarity. Sorry, John, thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it is it is 100% Pinot Noir and <laughs> the color kind of proves it out there. You know, Pinot can be so many different wines depending on where it's grown, right? And I, I make a wine from Signal Ridge up at 2,500 feet elevation in Mendocino Ridge. You can, you can see the, the vineyards from each other, Wiley and Signal Ridge. But because it's exposed to the sun, exposed to the wind, it's above the fog line you get a thicker, a thicker skin. And that wine is always darker in color, right? So it's nothing, it's nothing I'm doing. It's just the, it's the site, right? That, that, that offers up a, a lighter color or a darker hue. And, uh, but you can tell things about the site, you know, from the color um, and, and especially with Pinot Noir. Um, and it gives you hints as to the, you know, the structure of the wine as well. 13.1% alcohol. When I see that on a Pinot, I get very excited because that tells me you focused on picking at the right time. Rather than for bricks, you focused on when it was the right time to pick. And yeah. again, the aromatics, when I put this to my nose, my first thought was, I can't afford this. <laughs> but it's can't affordable. Afford it. It's completely reasonable. I, mm. I, I used to be a member of, of the uh, press and now a member of the trade. And I have gone to some amazing tastings of focus just on Pinot. Pinot is my favorite red grape variety. Yeah. And this is spectacular. Derek, this is a spectacular Pinot. Well, it's a spectacular vineyard, Carrie. And, uh, mm. and I, I, you know, you talk about the alcohol in the 13.1. Just one thing I want to point out about that. I'm not picking these grapes like before they're ripe, right? I mean, I'm picking the grapes when they're they're fully flavorful and developed. It's just the fact that they are nine miles grown, nine miles from the Pacific Ocean, and the fact that they're grown in shallow soils, and the fact that we dry farm the vineyard, all these factors come into play where you get you get that 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 development, that ripeness, those flavors at lower bricks. And my my mentor, Jeff Brinkman over at Reese, he he's the one that originally kind of planted that seed in my head you know, of, of growing grapes on shallow soils, hillside, 
sites um, and getting ripeness at low, low bricks. And, and, you know, you can't, if you get the alcohol up, the, the nose is kind of blown out, especially on a Pinot. So you need that you need low, low alcohol to be able to really appreciate everything it can be. And if I can tip my hat to you, Derek, you're, you're farming the vineyard and you're making the wine. You know, there's a special connection that you have with this place. And I, I would ask the grill master, Derek, what you would pair with this Pinot Noir. What I would pair with it? Oh gosh. Um, so, well, I like, I like salmon a lot. Um, I like a salmon with some mushrooms on it. You know, I mean, you can't go wrong with anything mushrooms and Pinot. Um, that's where my head's at right now. <laughs> that's my answer in this moment. If you ask me that question 10 more times, KP, I'll give you 10 more answers, but, um, salmon with some kind of mushroom sauce or drizzle. Sounds yeah. delicious. And John Gantis, our viewer also points out a glass. I agree. A with glass. John. glass works Cheers. in a pinch or a bottle as, as, as someone offered up earlier to you. So I mentioned Brad before I see the slide here. This is uh, some cool pictures I found when I was hanging out with him one day of Brad making the first cut on the property back in 1971. And you can see it was, it was uh, an orchard. It was the Colson Ranch and uh, a family that had you know, land, farmsteaded that land way back. And eventually Brad came along and turned it into a vineyard. And uh, that's Brad sitting on the back of his tractor a couple of years ago as we were riding around the, the place. And, you can see from the, the ground cover and all that green on the ground, we, uh, you know, we use um, organic uh, materials and we, we keep a permanent cover crop in the vineyard. Um, and uh, it's a pretty special place, beautiful place. I think we might, we might have a little fly over here too. Yay, perfect, thanks Catherine. Um, Maybe we can get that rolling. And this is as if you were flying in from the Pacific Ocean. Let's all imagine we're, we're hawks or eagles or some kind of cool bird. We're flying in um, from the, uh, the Northwest and you can see Anderson Valley stretched out in the distance. We're circling around. This was taken back in April, right before the growing season started. So we had just pruned the vines. That uh, large tree you see there is a lightning struck, you know, hundreds of trees. Um, that we um, call the snag. It's kind of our, our monument or our statue in the, uh, in the vineyard. Um, that's some mad scientist slash winemaker jerk walking through the vineyard. Um, and uh, you can see here, we've mowed some of the, some of the rows, but not some of the other rows. Um, one of the things, Brad still lives on the property and uh, it's Brad's job to mow the mow. mow. And uh, Brad mows for as long as he wants to mow. And then he he goes up and, and drinks some beer and eats a nice dinner and then he gets at it the next day. So we are kind of catching it in between uh, the mowing being finished here. And uh, here's the beautiful shot of the snag. And you also, you also saw a pond, a very full pond because we don't use that water. Like I've mentioned a few times now, we basically dry farm the vineyard, but I'm putting in some new blocks. I just planted some Chardonnay at the vineyard and we use it for the young vines. You do need water to establish the young vines. And uh, that's for that so this is a it's a really special vineyard i i'm pinch myself every day i go up there and that i get to work with it and i have uh purchased 20 acres across the highway from wiley that i'm planning to pinot noir right now as well so uh while i get to farm this you know prime of its life amazing perfect vineyard i'm, I'm also uh planning a vineyard for my seven-year-old son that he'll get to uh you know hopefully uh you know work with someday. We'll see. Then we're back to just zooming out, you know, um, seeing where Anderson Valley is sited relative to the wines I make in Russian River, like my Chardonnay, um, and the winery there in Napa. Um, you know, this is a, a special part of California. I think for, for my money, you know, what's going on in the, the true Sonoma coast, the in Anderson Valley and Santa Cruz mountains, Santa Lucia Highlands, you know, these, these areas in central and Northern California, there's some amazing, amazing wines being produced and, um, and uh, out of these regions. So any other questions, Catherine? 
No, just a lot of enthusiasm about where to buy the wines. Of course, go to Molly Stones first. <laughs> um, and then we also have a one-stop wine shop website, which I posted on the chat. Um, but Derek, we had some questions about if there's a winery to visit, um, you know, what's the future with, uh, with um, the winery and, and um, what are your hopes and aspirations for this beautiful project? Yep. That's a great question. Um, so in the in the vineyard side of things, I kind of teed up. I'm I'm planning a new vineyard. Um, I I I would eventually like to maybe make a single vineyard Chardonnay. You know, um, like let's say Wiley or maybe some of the vineyard the the two or three vineyards I work with in Russian River. Um, on the winery side of it, we're pretty all set with the studio. We do have um, we're not um, we don't have a tasting room anymore like we used to have. But we do have a hospitality center um, with my um, my distribution partners, the Trincaro family. Um, we we can host people by appointment. Um, you know, it's a private setting, um, private tastings. We do those up in Saint Helena. So any of you who are on the on the call tonight, if you'd like to drop me a line, go to the website. My contact info is there. If you want to set up a, you know, when things open up again, of course we're not we're not open right now, unfortunately. But when things do open up again. We'd be happy to host you for a tasting, or if you're just going to happen to be up in Anderson Valley, you know, um, send me a text or drop me an email, and uh, if I'm around and and uh, we can meet up in the vineyard, I'd be happy to do that as well. And the, you know, the biggest thing I'm ex I'm most excited about right now, I'm excited about everything. I mean, today I'm excited about the 2020 rosé because I kind of lived it this morning. But you know that that um, that sparkling wine, you know, that I'm making now is is really giving me a new energy. And really excited me because making sparkling wine is going down a whole other rabbit hole, you know, than, than making still wines. And it's been uh, just fascinating uh, to, uh, to do that. And it's the first vintage. Um, we're still trying to get a handle on what the future is for the sparkling. So we hope in the next two vintages to share that with the Molly Stones family. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I know I'm, I'm jumping the gun a little bit, probably even talking about it, but we're, uh, it's starting to slowly make its way out into the world beyond my house. <laughs> I made a whole 1,937 bottles. So um, uh, there's not that much. <laughs> we didn't make a, a whole lot of it. Did you go through Rack and Riddle? No, no, I did it at the studio uh, all myself. You're kidding me. No, I had, yeah, I, I did have help. Italy? Yeah, we did. We did everything. Um, so I did have a little bit of help. Um, I uh, through a, through a friend, I was introduced to a, a gentleman by the name of Craig Romer, and he was for like 15 years the winemaker at Shamsburg, and he used to take the Wiley fruit. So um, so I met with him, and he um, after I made the base wine, which I did myself, um, the Van Clare, um, I, I I met Craig, and he kind of came along for the let's make it bubble part of the adventure. And, uh, and we, it's, yeah, it's something that we did in house. Um, and it's, I don't know, but yeah, <laughs> wow. it's, it's kind of fascinating. I'll never forget the 1,937 bottles though, because 1937 was the year my father was born and it was the year that the Golden Gate Bridge opened. So I have two easy ways to remember our vast production of our 2018 vintage of Blanc de Noir. One of our guests uh, or viewers mentioned that the wines weren't available. They should be on every Molly Stone shelf right now. I, I know they're on mine in Sausalito. I work out of the Sausalito store and they're re ready to go. Um, and that's one thing I want to point can, can out. Can I tell you something about Sausalito real quick, Carrie? Yep, go ahead. Just something real quick about Sausalito. When I graduated college, I moved to Sausalito and the Sausalito Molly Stones was my grocery, most of my store. You know, that's, that's where I, I shopped for a year. And, uh, and so when I, when I got to go into Molly Stones, uh, I guess it's a couple of years ago now and start, you know, bringing my wines into Molly Stones, I was like, that was one of those, uh, what would you call it? Like, you know, it was a, it, it was, a, it was just a cool, a cool moment, like something coming full circle or like, wow, I've made it now. I'm in Molly Stones, I'm in my old Molly Stones, you know? It's a great store. I mean, uh, the fact that I made it to Molly Stones, I'm pretty happy. So, I, man, 
And from a producer standpoint, it's phenomenal. And Joshua points out that he was able to find these wines at the Green Bray uh, Molly Stones. So they are out there, they are available. Do you have any final words before I close it out? Well, I, I thank everyone for their time. And I thank you for all of you who tasted the wines with us. Um, I thank you, Carrie, for all the kind words and, um, mm -hmm. and your takes on the wines. You've made me excited about them. And, um, and, and I also thank everyone just for, you know, the, the fact that you guys are, um, you know, buying wines at Molly, buying my wines at Molly Stones, that's kind of keeping things rolling here and it's during a challenging time, obviously. So I know Catherine appreciates that. I know I, I appreciate that. And, uh, um, we're grateful and we're thankful. And, uh, I hope we know when, as things get better this year, which I'm sure they will, we'll all get to, uh, hang out a bit in person. <laughs> that would be phenomenal. Um, Roberta just messaged and um, I could tell you that the wines will be available for you. Thank you for your patience. And I want to thank everybody who, who logged in today. And Derek, again, thank you for making these wines. Um, I come from a winemaking background mm -hmm. and these, you make wine for winemakers and people who really, really appreciate it. I'm seeing all kinds of messages on the screen yeah. that you rock and that you <laughs> are phenomenal from from various viewers so that's the truth so keep doing what you're doing because it really really inspires inspires me these are wines that I'll be buying and that I'll be drinking and it's just phenomenal Derek so thank you and I'm, I'm seeing all of these uh, messages saying thank you and that all comes from the work that you've done so and Carrie, thank you very much for being such a great ambassador for us and the family. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. And, and one of the things I want to mention um, is in appreciation for logging on today for our viewers, we're offering a limited time 10% off discount off of the regular price of the wines that we tasted in this event. So the Bravium wines that we tasted in this lineup will be 10% off. You can mix and match you can buy one bottle or all of them, but please act soon because this offers only good until 9 p.m. tonight. Um, you can purchase these wines by at catering.mollystones.com. Again, that's catering.mollystones.com and you click on virtual events and that will take you to the purchase options. Now um, you can purchase them. They'll be available for pickup at your local Molly Stones the promotion code for that 10% discount is Bravium. Again, promotion code Bravium, B-R-A-V-I-U-M. And thanks again. Uh, we look forward to serving you at your local Molly Stones and cheers to everyone and have a fantastic weekend. Thank you all. Cheers.